Today is on Adult Protective Services, um, so we're excited to have Megan here. She could tell us a bunch of good things. So, um, just a few things that we just want to remind you guys about. Um, this in service is a paid in service, so we don't have treats unfortunately this time. You're all getting paid for this. Um, starting this Saturday, the 12th, um, everybody will be paid time and a half. So it used to be Sundays only was time and a half, but now Saturdays and Sundays are paid time and a half. So if you want to start working some Saturdays, if you already do, it's going to be even better. Um, we just want to remind you to make sure you're clocking in and out from your shifts. I know ERSP can be fidgety and annoying sometimes. We're trying to work out the bugs on that. Um, if you clock in and you get an error, we can still see you clocked in. So don't worry about it. Just as long as you're clocking in and out, great. So don't, don't worry if it shows red or doesn't show that you've clocked out, okay? Um, we're not doing a Christmas dinner this year, so but we are going to do something even better. We're going to celebrate Gary on his birthday in February. So, okay, so look forward to that. Um, we are recording this, so please save all your questions till the end. Um, is Kira or Robin here? I don't see you. So Kira and Robin are our caregivers of the month, so we just want to congratulate them. Um, they've really stepped up and helped with shifts, and they've really proved that they're a great caregiver and good with their clients, so we're happy to have them part of our Aspen team. So now I'm going to turn over to Megan. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm Evie Schmidt. I'm the training manager with Adult Protective Services. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. We're going to talk about some good stuff that's happening, some not so good stuff, but then also what our agency does with our investigations and then how we kind of partner and pair with community members. So it's going to look, um, it's changing in terms of how our aging population is shifting. And so we'll talk about that at the beginning, but the work that you're doing has never been more crucial than it is right now to serve the population. So we're going to start just kind of with some stats. So I'm a social worker, but my brain and my heart kind of goes with stats because I feel like it's the easiest way for individuals to kind of understand where things are at. This was done based on a study in 2020. And what this is showing us is that one in five Utah adults identify having a disability. The number was a lot higher than I kind of thought that it was going to be. They don't ask us to define kind of what a disability is. So it's just anybody that identifies. It could be a short-term, long-term disability from birth, work-related, different things like that. But just knowing that that represents half, like roughly half a million adults in Utah that have a disability, which that number is, if you think about the population kind of as a whole, it might not seem, but in terms of the individuals that we work with and that we serve, that's a, that's a high number of people that we're seeing. And then this kind of breaks down to the types of disabilities that people identify. Majority of the individuals that we work with, adult protective services, kind of fit into this first category of the cognitive disability. So that's dementia, age-related things that are happening, and also kind of um, like memory issues, different things like that. But then kind of the rest of these columns are a lot of the individuals that you guys are serving and that you're going out to work with. So just knowing that almost like 22% of our population in Utah are identifying with a disability, and that number is just going to continue to grow. And the reason why it's gonna to continue to grow is because our aging population is growing. And so this bar graph, I think is a good representation if you, regardless of your age, just to get kind of a better understanding of what this looks like, knowing that in 1900, there was around 3 million people that were aged 65 or older across the whole United States. Predicted by 2050, there's going to be almost 25 million people in the U.S. age 65 or older. And the reason why this is important is because are the services, are the resources, are the benefits going to reflect that? Like, do you guys foresee your agency quadrupling in size to meet that by 2050? And it looks the same way with us. 
with our services if we're able to, are we gonna have essentially 25 million percent more funding available, which is just unfortunately not gonna happen. And so it's how we can work together with our partners to make sure that we're meeting the needs for those individuals at that age. So this is specific to Utah. And the reason why this one is important for us to talk about is kind of that third column where it says the percent increase from 2009 to 2019. What I'm saying is that between that 10 year span for individuals 65 or older, which it's high in other areas, but then there are other areas where, like specifically Rhode Island, they only saw a 23% increase in that age population. So that specifically speaks to the work that home health agencies and care facilities and different things that are doing because now all of a sudden they have twice as many individuals in Utah that potentially could be receiving services. And so we'll talk about the aging brain a little bit. Because it's good for us to kind of get a brief understanding of it. I won't talk too much just because the more I talk about dementia, the more I talk about cognitive impairments, the more you guys are going to say, I think that's my mom, I think that's my aunt, I see some of these signs in myself. So it's good just to kind of go that way. Um, the joke is, if you recognize any of these signs in yourself, you're probably okay. But if there's other people that are like, oh, that really looks like that person, that's to where there could be a cognitive impairment happening. So what is normal brain aging? It's okay and normal to lose your keys, forget somebody's name. I expect all of you to forget my name. You may see me in the next week and be like, oh, she looks really familiar, but I have no idea where I saw her. That's totally normal. It's also normal to have issues with, oh, I need to go. Just is closer to the TV. Okay. Right there is perfect. Okay. <laughs> it's also totally normal to have changes in your ability to multitask and to remember kind of routine things. But for the most part, that's going to stay intact. Where we see the changes are individuals for the cognitive impairment piece of it. And where this is kind of that, where it's highlighted in green, it's the issues with kind of decision making on an everyday basis in terms of how you can keep yourself safe. We look at cognitive impairments kind of on a spectrum. So it's gonna be from the mild end to where you're living independently, still able to care for yourself, but maybe it's getting a little bit harder to manage those day-to-day -day things to the kind of severe end. Those are individuals that are moving into like assisted care facilities, needing kind of daily home health services, or they actually have a full-time caregiver that's moving into their home. So what is dementia? This is a good one for us to talk about because dementia is kind of a word that gets thrown around a lot, but I think not a lot of people really understand what it is, or they, they just automatically assume that it's a specific diagnosis that you have, but it's really not. It's a general term to describe any kind of decision-making complications that are happening, or if you're having trouble remembering, processing, basically carrying on those normal day-to-day -day tasks. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. So think of it kind of like an umbrella, and then you have all of these different kind of subsets that are underneath dementia. It happens in older life, but the big thing to know is it's not a normal part of aging. Mm -hmm. Just because you hit the age of 85, you're not automatically gonna be diagnosed with a cognitive impairment. And so if you are seeing individuals in their homes that are maybe showing some of the signs and symptoms, that is kind of, that can happen with aging, but it doesn't mean that everybody within the family is gonna be diagnosed with that, or just because you're seeing some of those things, it doesn't automatically mean that it's a cognitive impairment. So, pulling back the stats just a little bit, and then I promise I'll move on from them, but looking at where in 2014, there was estimated that five million adults in the US that were diagnosed with some form of dementia, and fast forward that to 2060, it's estimated that there's gonna be 14 million adults living in the US that are diagnosed with some form of a cognitive impairment. So that also speaks to the idea of how are your services and how is your agency gonna evolve in order to be able to meet the needs? Because there's a lot of individuals <laughs> that are diagnosed with dementia that are still living in their home, sometimes with minimal care, different things like that. But when that number is going to well over double within the next 20 years, are we gonna still see people living in their home? Are we gonna see more of that transition into like a care facility? So we need to look at those services and how we're gonna be able to reflect it. So here are the signs and symptoms. Breeze through them, don't look too long because you'll start to assume that it's somebody in your family <laughs> or yourself. Um, but just remember that's a general term. So uh, dementia looks different for everybody. It's not, there's not classic signs and symptoms that everybody's gonna get. So we sometimes think of like diabetes, MS, 
other medical diagnoses where you can kind of pinpoint, like these are going to be the expected signs and symptoms. This can happen, but it happens in a different order. It happens in a different way. It can happen over the course of a month, a decade. It's all different for everybody. So know that these are the classic things that we're gonna see, but not everybody is gonna fit into that same category. And then we shift in kind of what is elder abuse, because that's a big role of what we're doing with Adult Protective Services. The World Health Organization does a really good job of kind of summarizing what this looks like, because the bottom half of this goes through all of the different allegations that we investigate at our agency. For the work that you do, the takeaway is to see the two underlying parts. So know that it's a single or a repeated act. So physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse can happen one time to somebody, or it can happen repeatedly over the course of months, a decade. Both of those situations constitute abuse. The other part is the expectation of trust. So there's a caregiver, there is somebody that is in place that is perpetrating this abuse against a vulnerable adult or an older adult. But the idea is that that older adult had that expectation of trust, that this person was gonna take care of me, that they were gonna provide the proper care for me, and now they are taking these steps to abuse me, neglect me, or exploit me. And crimes against people with disabilities. As we talked about knowing that there's roughly half a million people in Utah that identify as having a disability, this looks at national stats. What's staggering to me is to see that individuals identifying with a disability kind of encompass 12% of the population but 26% of the crimes are happening against them. So it's a disproportionate number. And so we're seeing that because individuals with a cognitive impairment, medical or mental health impairments, different things like that, they are just at a, a rate of just being more vulnerable than other people. But so now they are actually being perpetrated at a higher level against them. And some kind of abuse in the disability <coughs> communities. Um, with this, just know that individuals with disabilities, like the stats say, they're just much more likely to be victims of crime, exploitation. They're just going to ex experience abuse at a much higher rate than, than other populations. And so what does this have to do with adult protective services? So we'll talk about kind of how this relates, but the big thing is, is it looks at kind of our overall, our vision and mission within so it says DOS, which is the Division of Aging and Adult Services. And what that means is our vision is offering choices for independence. So we want to help individuals age, live, and basically enjoy their lives how they want to, in the environment that they want, in the setting, with the supports that they want. And so we are heavily reliant on community partners, family members, the individual themselves to advocate for what they want in order for us to basically put in either services, recommendations, different things like that to help them do that. The big thing with this is somebody in your community, a family member, somebody that you're serving as a client, they may want to live or age in a way that you do not feel is appropriate for them or you don't feel is in their best interest. But as an adult, they have the right to live and age the way that they want. So that can be a hard thing for individuals that work in the social work field and kind of the helping professions to really recognize that it's for the same reason that I hope all of you are able to live and age the way that you want and that those rights are not taken away by somebody. So, Adult Protective Services. We are the state agency and we do have the authority and responsibility to investigate abuse and neglect and exploitation for vulnerable adults in the state. So who is a vulnerable adult? I've said the word a few times, so let's kind of define who that is. Um, categorically, it's anybody that's age 65 or older is deemed a vulnerable adult in the state of Utah. What's interesting about that is that number, it's, it's kind of hard for some people to understand or swallow, mainly because our assistant attorney general, she's 65 and she works 80 hours a week. She would never identify herself as a vulnerable adult because she just said like, that I just don't, I live by myself, I'm able to care for my family, I, yeah, she works. I mean, she's always working. Uh, but then there's other individuals in the community that are 65 that do require a lot of assistance or care or they maybe have a cognitive impairment. So that's why that number sits kind of where it is. So not everybody is going to see that and agree with that, but that's just kind of how our statute's written. And then also anybody 18 or older with a mental or physical impairment that substantially impacts their ability to care for themselves. So those are kind of some ideas below of where we would look at. So if, if they're not able to access or provide food for themselves or shelter or 
like financial decision making in order to be able to properly care for themselves, they may be deemed a vulnerable adult. There's no diagnosis. Not everybody with Down syndrome is a vulnerable adult. Not everybody that is in X, Y, and Z things are automatically a vulnerable adult. It's a case by case basis. So for you as caregivers, don't automatically see a diagnosis or see some concerns and assume that they have to be a vulnerable adult. Because we have a lot of individuals that call in and say that my neighbor is wheelchair bound, they have to be vulnerable. But nope, they're able to live independently, they have a van that they're able to access transportation, they have the adequate steps in their home to be able to take care of themselves so they're not a vulnerable adult. But from a community perspective, you may assume that they're limited in their ability to do those things. So what APS can do. The reason why we bring this up is there's a kind of an idea that we are child protective services for adults. So I do hear that a lot. People just assume they're like, well, you go in and take people out of their homes and you move them into nursing homes, different things, which is not the case. So what we are able to do kind of under our statute is we're able to investigate allegations of abuse. We perform what we call a needs assessment to determine what's happening and then what we need to do to help prevent that from happening. And then we also coordinate we rely heavily on our community partners. We are an investigative agency. We're not case management. We're not able to work with individuals long term. So we're reliant on our AAAs and our other agencies in the community to help perform those services. And what we can't do. So the list is a little bit longer about what we can't do, unfortunately. But the big ones for you to understand is we do not remove adults against their will from their home. The only time that we would go in and remove somebody from their home is if we have basically substantial evidence that it's life or death for that individual. And so, and in that case, if that is what's happening, we have to go get a court order to remove somebody from their home. And so it's, we, if you guys would call us with an emergency situation, we are not able to go out and remove somebody the same day. It generally takes 72 hours because we have to get a court order written up, the judge has to sign off on it, and different things like that. So know that, if it's an emergency situation where you feel that it is truly life or death, law enforcement needs to be the first call because they're able to take additional steps that we're not able to without basically a subpoena in place. And the other things that we can't do, we don't take custody of adults. I am a former investigator. We don't serve as guardians. We don't go in and make that decision making. And we also don't place people in nursing homes. We do have family members that call a lot and say, my grandmother is falling more. I'm concerned that she's not able to shower herself. She's not able to care for herself. Can you come and move her into an assisted living facility? We do get those calls a lot and those requests a lot. And that's just not something that we're able to do unless we have that emergency court order. And then at that point, and the reason why we only go to that point when it's kind of the last possible option is because we don't get to work with that individual about what assisted living they want to move into, we are finding the one with the most immediate availability, and oftentimes it's not in their community. And so if we would move, remove somebody from the Orem community, there's a chance they could be placed at a facility in Logan. And so we want to make sure that we are looking at the least restrictive options first, and so that's what community partners, what else we can put in place to prevent that from happening, unless we know that it's a life or death situation. So a common question that I get asked, how do I decide if a vulnerable adult is being abused, neglected, or exploited? So your role as caregivers, as family members, people in the community, it's not your responsibility to decide if somebody is being abused, neglected, or exploited. It is your responsibility to report those concerns. So everybody in the state of Utah is a mandated reporter. If you have moved here from a different state, it looks a little bit differently. I'm from Minnesota, and in Minnesota, not everybody's a mandated reporter. It's social workers, it's doctors, it's medical professionals, those kind of things. But you're not mandated to report on your neighbor in other states, but here you are. And so if you do have any concerns for abuse, neglect, or exploitation, you are required to make that report. It is a class B misdemeanor if you do fail to report and you know. Um, so we've, the hope would be that we wouldn't ever get to that point with where we'd have to pursue like criminal charges against somebody, but just know that you are legally bound to make a report. And some stats. So these are from about a week ago. Um, this kind of shows the top part where it says calls to APS statewide. So as of the end of October, we have received 11,579 calls. And so that is what I will say is just the calls that were reported to us. The amount of abuse that's happening in Utah does not come close to that. So I mean, it's, 
it's way outside of that number. But so that's actually what's being reported to us. Financial exploitation is our number one investigation. It grows more and more every year, but as you can see, we're from financial exploitation to caretaker, it's almost double. And so we are gonna, no matter what, we're always gonna see financial exploitation as the number one. The thing I'll say about this is it's rarely just one allegation. I, every once in a while, I go out on just a financial exploitation call, but it's usually financial, financial, emotional abuse, caretaker neglect. It's multiple allegations that are happening for one individual. And so the types of abuse that we investigate. So we look at physical abuse, which is kind of the typical things you think of like biting, hitting, pinching, scratching, pulling hair, pushing somebody, those kind of things. But it also looks at kind of the inappropriate use of like medical and chemical restraints. And so what that would be is somebody in their home or in a care facility that's being tied to their bed, to their wheelchair, because the family or the caregiver is concerned that they're wandering or they may fall, different things like that. So though, even though in their mind it seems like a safe thing to do, that is a form of abuse. Or the other thing we see oftentimes with individuals with disabilities or with cognitive impairments, they are medicated to keep them calm. And so facilities or caregivers are saying they're a danger to somebody else or they're a danger to, the, to themselves or we're just worried about kind of their behaviors and so we wanna help keep them calm. But if it's not written into a medical like treatment plan for them to have that medication for that purpose, that is also a form of abuse as well. And then emotional abuse. It's our hardest investigation to, or our hardest allegation to investigate because oftentimes it's he said, she said, or somebody said this to me, different things. If you would ever have concerns for this for somebody that you're working with, document what's happening. Um, I've had people that have used recordings and they, we've been able to use that as evidence where they actually have their phone recording somebody, how they're speaking to them. But with emotional abuse, it's not how you perceive what that person is saying, it's how that person perceives it. And so we've got individuals that have advanced Alzheimer's or that are living in memory care institute facilities and they're being spoken to in a way that seems hurtful and detrimental. But when speaking to that person, they have no memory or no idea that that was happening. And so if it's not impacting that person itself, it may not constitute emotional abuse, even if you feel that it's hurtful and detrimental to that person. But on the flip side, we oftentimes have people assume that somebody with Down syndrome is not gonna understand what's being said to them so they can, you can talk freely to that person. But if at any point in time, they are feeling confined, embarrassed, any of those emotions related to what's being said, that is emotional abuse. And some physical indicators of abuse. These are kind of the general things that we think about. Um, the takeaway from this is, and what we oftentimes look at, is the injuries that are incompatible with the explanations. So an example I'll give is, if somebody has a full-time caregiver and they fell getting off of the toilet, and they are saying that they fell on their left side, but when our investigators go out, the bruising is all down the right side. If they're not able to match up and let us know why, why all of a sudden, why, and they're adamant that they fell on their left side, that's a red flag for us because what they're saying is not compatible to what we're seeing and what the evidence is. And then also the other thing that we're looking at is bruising that's in various stages of healing. So there's some individuals that require like two lift assistance, different things like that. So it's normal to have bruising on the back of your arms, different things. But if you require assistance to move from, let's say, a wheelchair to your bed, but all of a sudden you have bruising going all the way down the back and there's no report of a fall, that's a red flag to us as well. Because why would there be bruising in an area if there's no indication that a fall has occurred? So some behavioral indicators of abuse. A lot of these you'll see as individuals age, like there's some with like confusion, depression, different things like that that are just natural that can happen as we age that don't indicate that there's something going on, but it's when there's multiple things that are happening. The last part where it appears frightened or shuts down with like a family member or a caregiver walks into the room, that's the one that we look for, especially for individuals that are maybe not able to verbalize what's happening. You will see that their demeanor changes when somebody walks into the room. So they oftentimes will avoid eye contact, they'll shift their body, they will start to have physical kind of reactions to those things. So if you are providing care in the home for somebody and a family member walks in and you notice those things that are happening, that's usually an indication that something's going on and it may warrant a report to us. So showing respect is kind of a direct care staff. We'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, 
The big thing with this one, and this is more, if, do you guys ever, are you contracted to go into like assisted living facilities and different things? Okay. So for this, this would be, and it's something we oftentimes forget, individuals that are living in care facilities, their room is their home. So that one space is oftentimes all that they have. And so what we see sometimes is without the intent of trying to cause harm, staff will just walk into rooms and they'll say, oh, Joyce, I'm here to help you do these things without that recognition that that would be like somebody, my neighbor walking into my house and saying, Megan, I'm going to come do this for you without knocking, without announcing themselves, different things like that. So with this one, we want to make sure that you are kind of announcing yourself when you're walking in. You're also, if somebody's voicing something to you, you're sitting back and you're listening. Even if you've got 10 other individuals that you need to see that day, your time with that person is their time as well. So kind of recognize those things, slow down, take a breath. You are oftentimes like a very trusted individual for a lot of the people that you're working with. So make sure that they know that they can open up to you if something's going on or if they have concerns, they can let you know about it. And so neglect. Caretaker <coughs> neglect is a large allegation that we look at as well. Um, I just realized I forgot to tell you a few slides back there were some photos. The photos that are in here are investigations that have been done in Utah. Mm -hmm. So these are things that are happening. Um, they're not just like stock photos that we use. So from the caretaker side, it's failure to provide or basically allow that person to have the necessary care that they need. So it looks at those things of food, shelter, medical help. That would be getting somebody to a medical appointment, making sure that they have dentures. Um, We've got a lot of individuals that don't have access to like hearing aids or their glasses that they need. So if a caretaker is responsible to do that and they're failing to do that, that is a form of neglect that's happening. And the other part is failure to provide that care in a necessary and kind of a reasonable time frame. So if there was a few of you going out to a few different homes and one of you is, and you're all providing the same care, one of you takes eight minutes, one of you takes 45, the other one takes 65, I'd question that eight minute person. Like, why are you able to get in and out of that house so quickly? Are you providing all the necessary care that person needs compared to two of your other colleagues that are in there spending a full hour doing the necessary care? And then what we talked about a little bit earlier, intentional failure to follow through on that prescribed like medical or treatment plan that that person is needing. And then also abandonment. Um, this one, I'll just highlight for a second. Um, this man was in his 30s. He had some oh severe um, intellectual disabilities. He had lived at home with his mom for his whole life. She was his full-time caregiver. And even though she had been talked to numerous times by medical providers, family members, she did not process the amount of neglect that she was showing towards her son. So because he had his impairments and functioned at like a three or four year old level, she had fed him infant formula his entire life. So that was his source of like his calorie intake. And in her mind, she was providing the necessary care that he had required based on his age and development. But for her to not understand the level that he was being neglected at, I think when we removed him from the home, he was like less than 40 pounds. Whoa. And so, but for her, in her mind, she was providing the care that he needed because he had a bed, he had a home, he had like meals that were coming in, but she wasn't able to process kind of what was needed. And then passive neglect. This one we talk about because with the shift with our cell phones and the use of social media, use of documentation, because we used to all document on paper. Like everybody had a chart and you would write notes that way. If you're under the age of 30, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but there was a time when that's how you documented. You went back to the desk and you would write notes in terms of what you did, what happened, how their affect was. But now oftentimes we pull up our phones and we have their charts available and we document that way. The reason why passive neglect is important to talk about is because when your phone becomes basically here, separation between the care that you're providing for that individual. If you have a smartphone, you have access to social media on the same phone that where you're accessing your charts. And so if you are documenting something for a provide like care that you just provided, but you're still in the room with the individual, but you get a text or an email, so you check that, and then they're like, oh, see this TikTok that I sent you, and then you're moving on to those things, you're not actively neglecting that person, but you are passively because now your attention, your time, your energy is being drawn away from the client that you're supposed to be working with. And self-neglect. 
We talk about this because this is on the rise in Utah, mainly because individuals are living and aging longer. And so we've got more people living in their homes. If your home has lived, looked like this your entire adult life, that is a personal choice for you to have. But if your home has been immaculate and then over the last six months, it slowly started to decrease and all of a sudden you're not showering, you're not able to care for yourselves, that's when we know that there may be something that's going on that we would need to look at. So what rights do, does a vulnerable adult have in respect to our investigations? If we determine that a person has capacity, so they have an understanding of what's happening, they know how to make their own choices and how to make changes to it, they have the right to self-determination. So that means that they can live in an environment that other people may not think is safe. Um, that speaks a lot to, we have a number of hoarding homes in Utah, mm -hmm. and if the home is owner-occupied, the person has a right to live their way, even though it goes against Home health agencies oftentimes going in, family members, law enforcement, code officials. If there's utilities on, even if it's water dripping out of a faucet, that means utilities on and the health department oftentimes is not able to do anything. So just those things are good things to think about. And also if somebody has self-determination, they can say, nope, I'm going to slam the door in your face and I don't want you to come in. We have that happen all the time. So I have spoken to many people through cracked windows as they're like walking into their backyard and I'm like kind of screaming over the fence. We do whatever we can to make our investigations work, but just know that you may call in and there's nothing that we're able to do because that person is like, nope, get out of here, I'm done with you. And we have to ex expect that as, a, as an adult. So bed sores, sorry for the photos, but it's, it's there for a reason, for us to kind of recognize and see what this is. Knowing that, um, I should ask, does everybody, I'm assuming, know what a bed sore is or have heard of it or trained on it? Okay, hopefully you guys will not see it in your practice, um, or if you see it, it's in kind of like that stage one category. But these were individuals that were removed from their homes due to having bed sores. Um, know that they can develop over months, but it could also happen over the course of a week. So it's anybody that is essentially in an immobile position, so in a wheelchair, in the hospital bed, even in a recliner. If they're in there for an extended period of time and not able to move themselves, they are susceptible to those bed sores. And then also knowing that it always starts, um, and you may see this as a caregiver, it starts as just, it looks like a pimple or a little pinprick or just a small little space. And then within literally a course of a week and a half, it can get down to the bone. Mm -hmm. So it happens very quickly. Individuals that have um, kind of circulation issues, so diabetes, um, congestive heart failure, different things like that, they are at a much higher rate and susceptible of those bed sores. And it's also just if the person is on a rotation schedule, please monitor that. Please make sure that it's being done in order to prevent that from happening. Um, when we have to kind of get to the point where if we know that that's happening in the removal, Sometimes there's just not treatment that can be done at the hospital, depending on how far it's progressed and different things like that. And then it's more of the maintenance versus the prevention piece of it. Um, what I will say with this is that law enforcement is being trained more and more in terms of how to spot this as a possible neglect that's happening. In the past, they would oftentimes go to homes, do the welfare checks. They would see an older woman that's laying in a hospital bed in the middle of the living room, because that's oftentimes how it happens. And they ask her, how are you doing? We've got concerns that your son's not providing care. And she says, nope, everything's great. I'm totally fine. I've got these things. The covers are pulled up to her neck, different things like that. She's a little bit apprehensive, but she's usually willing to talk to law enforcement because most older people are. And so they say, okay, bye, and they leave. But now what our law enforcement are being trained on is they're being trained to separate, not having multiple officers in there. One officer will be in there and they'll just say, like, oh, can I just make sure that your sheets are clean? Because if they're not, I want to make sure to help your son get them changed before we leave. He may need some extra help with that. And they'll use those kind of subtle cues to lift up those covers to check for yeah. these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so we've had officers recently in West Valley, like one officer found a level, like basically a stage four bed sore that was happening. She was saying that she was perfectly fine mm -hmm. because she didn't want her son to get in trouble. But due to him knowing that and taking those extra steps, we were able to get her removed from the home, get her in the hospital, and kind of start those treatment things. So just know that you will see more and more older adults that don't want to get their grandsons, their sons, their kids in trouble. And so they will literally allow a bed sore to get to their bone and still not say anything that it's happening. 
And so some just indicators of neglect. Um, we do see a lot of hoarding homes in Utah. We do go out on those. It's usually what resources, what supports we can put into place. Um, the big thing with that is, is it's not just bringing a dumpster and clearing somebody's house out. There's mental health support that needs to go into place. There's a lot of like ongoing therapy that needs to happen to prevent situations like this from happening again. Um, animal hoarding is big in Utah as well. Um, I think just because the restrictions are pretty limited in terms of, we had somebody up in the northern region that had 200 rabbits in his house. <laughs> and he did my, what? Yeah, and he, so he left his home and moved into a trailer next door and continued to allow his rabbits. But they were getting out and being like shot by neighbors and different things like that. But he has the capacity. He understood what he was doing, and so he made the choice to allow his home to basically be, be overtaken by rabbits and just moved into a trailer next door. So those are <laughs> those are the situations that do happen. Um, financial exploitation. This is our number one allegation that we do investigate. This is kind of a quick summary of it. Just know that it's illegal or improper use of an, a vulnerable adult's funds, credits, or assets. The reason why this is important is because the amount does not matter. If, you have, if you've got somebody that's lived on a fixed income and you take 50 cents off of their dresser, that's financial exploitation because that may be money that they need for the bus. That may be money that they need for things that may seem like a small amount to you. So we see that a lot in like care facilities and we even have like financial exploitation is taking somebody's food or their soda or something like that from their rooms as well because that's something that they purchased and it does belong to them. And so this kind of gives an idea of like who a financial caregiver is. It doesn't have to be a guardian or a power of attorney or anything like that. It's anybody that's assuming that role of helping with somebody's finances. So it can be formal or informal. Um, unfortunately, what we see is that two thirds of the perpetrators are immediate family members. So it's spouses, it's adult children, it's grandchildren that are moving back in the home. We do have a lot of scams and frauds in Utah but majority of the time it's somebody that you know that's gonna do that. And so these are kind of the problems that we see with those financial caregivers. The big one for this to take away is if you know somebody that's diagnosed with dementia or cognitive impairment, and all of a sudden they have a new will, they have a new power of attorney or something like that, that's a red flag. Because if that person is diagnosed with a cognitive impairment, their doctor is determining that they do not have the right to sign legal paperwork. And so if that does change, that's a pretty big red flag that we look for. And then personal dignity exploitation. We're gonna highlight this one mainly because um, it's come with the kind of change with social media and with our smartphones. What this one essentially says is you are guilty of this, and I say guilty because it is in criminal code as well and you can be prosecuted. If you take a photo of a vulnerable adult in a compromising position or in a way that puts them, like their mental or physical health in harm. So an example would be, if you were in a care facility providing care for somebody and they um, have soiled their brief and you need to go get them changed, you're really frustrated with the day, it's already seven o'clock and you're still working, and you take a photo of that individual on the toilet and send it to your boyfriend and say, look what I have to deal with, that is what this statute is for and you will be criminally prosecuted for it. And so we have seen the rise with people transmitting things like that on TikTok and social media because they're, I'll just use the word, they're young and dumb. They don't understand what the consequences that could be from this. We're not prosecuting people in their 50s and 60s with this. This is 18, 19, 20 year olds that are new to the field and don't understand where that line is in terms of the harm that they could cause, especially when they think this person doesn't understand what's happening or they're never gonna see it. But almost always that a family member of them is gonna find it, they're gonna see it, and those kind of things. So we will skip to, okay. So quickly, who is kind of perpetrating this? So we're seeing, this is kind of, when we look at overall, these are the individuals that we're seeing. More than likely, it's gonna be male. That just kind of how things work out that we see. Um, I think that comes down to why we have, or part of the reason why there's so many financial exploitation. But it's paid and unpaid caregivers. It's not, it doesn't distinguish between those two things. But we oftentimes see individuals with like mental health issues, substance health issues, different things like that. Um, a lot of them are unemployed. It's a lot of like adult sons living in the basement of their mother's home, different things like that. That's a lot of what we see with the perpetrators. And some barriers. Some of the things that we had talked about a little bit, but the shame, embarrassment, it's that how could I let this happen or how, how could my grandson or my family member do this to me? And so it goes unreported because they are ashamed that it happened. Um, the 
idea of fear dependency of poor care, because we have a lot of people that will say, if you tell somebody, they're going to put you in a home. That's just kind of a statement that gets thrown around a lot, which is not true, because you now know that we can't remove people from their homes and put them into a facility. But I've had older adults answer the door, and I can hear that person in the background saying, if you talk to them, they're going to pull you out of the home. And so just knowing that that's happening, you could overhear conversations like that as well. And so advocating and letting that older adult know that that's not possible and then immediately call us to let us know that something like that's happening. Because if they're making that statement and you've heard it, it's not the first time they've said it. Mm -hmm. And the last part, which unfortunately it just happens too much, is wanting to protect the perpetrator. <coughs> and knowing that two thirds of the perpetrators are family members, we just see that high rate of wanting to protect that person. Um, the cost of care. So this one is becoming more and more important because it's being recognized how demanding and stressful direct care work is. So I worked in mental health and social work for a long time. Um, it's something that I've talked about for a long time because it's usually more recognized on kind of the mental health side, but we're seeing what is being considered like vicarious or secondary trauma. And so it's the experiences that you guys are having as caregivers as a result of the caring that you're providing for. So an older adult telling you a story about something traumatic that happened to them, that carries with you. Whether you forget about it because you go on to those same things, it's those kind of micro stories that add up to that leads to burnout, leads to attrition, which is like calling into work or like substandard care. So those are the things that do build up. So if you are a manager or supervisor, please look for those signs and symptoms that could be happening in your staff and have an action plan. And then if you are direct care staff, lean on your coworkers, like ask for support, ask for additional time for things. If you've got time off from work, use it. It's don't use the badge of honor of keeping your time built up and different things like that. Like there's a reason why it's there and use it to, to make sure essentially that you can prioritize your health and then provide the best care to the clients that you're working with. We'll go through this slide. Okay, and then how to report. So as I said, everybody in Utah is a mandated reporter. So it lets you know that you can contact our agency, Adult Protective Services, or law enforcement. So you're not responsible to contact both. It's best if you do because then your first-hand knowledge is being reported to both entities. But if you would report to us and we find out that there's criminal involvement, we do report to law enforcement and vice versa. They will let us know if, if it involves a vulnerable adult. So you can call us Monday through Friday, kind of during business hours, our 1-800 number. Um, the e-referral is probably the best just because it can be submitted at any time. Um, the one thing I will say, just kind of, we talked about a little bit, if it's 517 on a Friday and you found something in a home, like do not call us because unfortunately our intake workers are not there to answer the phone. Like please call law enforcement, different things like that, because we're not an emergency response agency. And so it would be responded to if you'd leave a message with us, we'd call you back Monday, open a case. But by that time, almost 72 hours could have gone by between what's being, what's happening. And then how can you help? So these are just kind of some tips for you. Um, mainly, it's kind of those watching and observing those signs, active listening, the reports and disclosure of what's happening. It's not usually like you sit down face to face with somebody and they're like, let me tell you what happened to me. It's usually like when they're in a vulnerable position that they're kind of disclosing little things that are happening. And it may not happen all at once, but it could be that my son yelled at me yesterday. And then the next time you go out and see them, and like my son is still yelling at me, and yesterday he pushed me into the wall. And then a few days later, you go back, and it's those things that are building up, and he stole my debit card. So you'll start to see that those stories will build as you develop more rapport with the individuals. So just know that they may not be willing to disclose everything or open up right away, so it may take some time. Um, but report to us as soon as you do have a concern, and then we're able to build those investigations as well. And then lastly, in July, we moved away from the 273 talk number, which was the Utah um, suicide phone number that people were able to call. Now all you have to do is dial 988. If you have an out of state area code, like mine is still from Minnesota, it would direct me to Minnesota and then it would bounce me back to Utah. But if you've got a Utah area code, you can dial 988 or you can have your clients dial 988 from their cell phones and it'll bring them to a trained crisis worker. So we are seeing an increase in mental health crisis for older adults. So we wanna make sure the services are available. And then, oh, I'm already getting excited. Um, <laughs> and so there's my contact information. Any questions that anybody has?